All righty. It looks like our participants are leveling off a little bit. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sam Briggs. I'm the Clean Water uh, Program Director at the Isaac Walton League. Go ahead, Heather. Hey, Heather. I'm the Midwest Save Our Streams Coordinator coming to you from Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, we're saying where we're from. I'm from wow. Gaithersburg, Maryland. <laughs> um, so we're coming to you from different parts of the country, but working together to share our strategies, a beginner's guide to water quality communication. Um, so Heather's going to head off into the background here, just some, some intro stuff about this presentation. Feel free to put questions as you have them in the chat. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so there, the recording will be accessible uh, probably like 48 hours after this webinar is done. We'll have that up on our uh, webinar YouTube and on our website, so you'll be able to access it after the fact. Um, and we're going to have some polls and questions in here as well. So please get ready to participate. And once again, ask all those questions in the chat. Um, you can direct them to everybody so everybody can see your question and also see our responses as we go through this presentation. All right, so first question, let us know in the chat where you are tuning in from. We want to know where everybody is. As we mentioned, I'm in Maryland. Heather is out in Iowa. So let's see what's coming in Central Illinois. We got some West Virginia folks, Maryland folks, Connecticut folks, Pennsylvania, all over the place. Virginia, New Jersey. Awesome. Let's see, who did I miss? Houston, Texas, Kentucky, Michigan, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Awesome. So we have folks from all over the place. So I'm sure that we will have some insights from folks as well from what they've learned in their regions and what works as far as social media. So here's our first poll. How would you rate your level of confidence with social media? So go ahead and we'll give folks a few seconds to answer that poll. All right, so for those results, um, about half of us, almost half of us are considered, we would consider ourselves competent in social media. That's awesome. We have a handful, about a third of us are either proficient or experts. That's amazing. And we do have some beginners, so that's great. Um, and some blank canvases that we're working with here. So for those experts and proficient folks, uh, we're looking for your input and for Everybody else, we're hoping you learn something and ask plenty of questions along the way. All right, so we're here talking specifically about water quality monitoring and communication. Um, so most of our folks that are involved in our programs are involved in SaltWatch, uh, Save Our Streams monitoring, which is macroinvertebrates, other types of monitoring. We have some folks on the line here that are also involved in other programs where they do different types of water quality monitoring. Perhaps it's E. coli, conductivity. Um, so all of that monitoring, all that effort we put in, it leads to data. And that data then leads to action. Um, but what we need to transition that data into action is effective communication. Because for a lot of the folks, you know, that are walking down the street, they don't necessarily know what all that data means until it is effectively communicated to them. All right, so science communication basics. Um, the goals of science communication is to engage new audiences or existing audiences, share information, and provoke change in opinion or behavior. We, we work on that a lot. Um, and it's important with your science communication that you know your audience. So tailor your content to the audience that you're trying to reach. Uh, when in doubt, keep your posts really broad and accessible um, so that you get a lot of different folks that can, you know, gain information from your posts, from your communication. And don't make assumptions about prior knowledge. Um, this is particularly hard for folks on our team sometimes because we are in the trenches every day. Um, you know, pulling macroinvertebrates. I was in a meeting the other day where I was picking through a sample of macroinvertebrates while talking about, you know, our databases and things like that. So um, we are in the trenches. So we don't want to make assumptions about somebody else 
and their knowledge about what we're doing. So we got to start with background information and then give them some basic information that makes sure that our communication is coming across and they're walking away with information that they can bring back to their community. Um, so how to undercut your message. These are things that we do not want to do. Um, the first is that we do not want to uh, overuse jargon. Another one that's particularly hard for us, right? We want to make sure that we're explaining things in, in an accessible way. Um, be careful of acronyms as well. Uh, we have tons of acronyms in our field, and that results in us, you know, sharing a bunch of letters that folks may not understand. So make sure you're spelling out your acronyms. Um, avoid a confrontational tone. Uh, we ran into this issue when we launched our salt watch program. We said, you know, road salt is bad. Nobody should be using it. And then we had a bunch of responses that were folks saying, okay, you want me to get into a car wreck on my way to the hospital. And that was really not the message that we wanted to portray. We wanted to portray that smart salting is important, not no salting. Um, make sure that you don't have a lack of objective data. All right. So make sure that you're not, um, uh, you're also not downplaying the legitimacy of your data. And then don't overstate the implications of your data either. So if something is correlated versus caused by something, make sure that you're being explicit in what your data actually means and the conclusions that you can draw from it. Also make sure you're looking for common ground, all right? So everybody is will find value in some facet of water quality. And that is a fact. We all have to drink it. We all... Um, not all of us, but some of us would like our property values to improve because our water quality is better. We all need to eat food and thus water quality is important when it ties to agriculture. Um, people care about human health, they care about environmental impacts, they care about economic impacts and the ecosystem services that come back to it. So make sure that if you're tackling a particular issue around water quality, let's say, you know, I'm going to use the road salt example a lot today, that can tie back to a lot of different uh, groups of people just based on what they care about. That's a water quality issue. That's an infrastructure issue that rusts out the bottom of cars. It has an environmental impact. Um, that can be divided up into different facets as well. So it can affect native plants on the side of the road. It can affect fish in freshwater waterways. Um, so keep that in mind as you are talking about the issues that you care about. Look for that common ground so that you can meet people where they are. Oops. Okay. Communication resources from IWLA. So we have a ton of resources that can help you out with your messaging um, as you are crafting your message, sharing your results, and hopefully inciting change in your communities. So we have an advocacy guide. Um, so this is a pretty, pretty robust document. I think it's about 40 pages. Um, and that's on our website. And it has tips and advice for identifying your problem and your audience using your data in communications, building partnerships, identifying asks, and influencing policymakers. Uh, within that advocacy guide, there's also um, kind of, you know, the government 101 and how to, to make change at the policy level, whether it's uh, very local, regional, or statewide, um, or federally as well. Uh, and then we have success stories in there. So what has worked for some of our volunteer groups? And we are always going to be adapting this guide moving forward. So adding different success stories, more information as we come across it. So please, if you have a success story that you'd like to share and put it in our guide, let us know and we can include that as an appendix in our advocacy guide. So to find that advocacy guide, it's a little bit hidden on our website, but if you go to iwla.org, um, and then under the clean water tab, there's a section called resources for monitors. And that's where the advocacy guide lives. So it's free to download. Um, please share it widely so we get folks involved. And as always, send us your success stories so we can include those as well. Our clean water hub is the water quality database that we crafted to use for um, our water quality data. So right now that includes save our streams, chemical and biological data, salt watch data. Um, it will have nitrate watch data in there as well when that launches. Um, and then we have uh, Virginia save our streams data. And then we're about to make a bacteria protocol live as well. So you'll have room to put your bacteria data in there. Um, 
So our goal for the Clean Water Hub was to make data easy to submit and easily accessible for our volunteers, and then also easy to understand and share so that you could really take our data and make it easier to make change in your communities. So here is the Clean Water Hub. This is what the homepage looks like. You can explore all those data points on that map. Um, that's the community map. So that's all the data that's housed in the Clean Water Hub right now. And what you can see there is the purple dots are are sites where it has data that's been collected in the last year. And the gray dots are sites that have data in there, but they're just older than the past year, so not as recent. So the nice thing about the hub is that you can view and export those graphs that it makes. So if you're at a site monitoring over time and you're seeing spikes in a particular parameter, you can use those maps to really show how that change has taken place. Uh, you can download the data. Um, from your actual site or from your organization. So you can manipulate that data however you want. And then we also have fact sheet templates that we've created that you can use uh, to share your data and give it to somebody who doesn't necessarily have the background information on the data you're collecting. Um, so here's an example of one of those fact sheets. What is nitrate? We also have some fact sheets that we've constructed and they're just in, in Word. So you don't need kind of special, you know, in design or anything to use these fact sheets, but we have some constructed that also have blank spaces where you can fill in your own charts, um, fill in your own information, add different graphics or pictures, um, add some specific information about your organization or your stream site, and then distribute those to you know your um, county government, your state government, your city government, uh, your neighbors and friends, anyone who you know, you'd like to have know more about your water quality that you're monitoring. We also have letters to the editor templates. Um, right now we have those for our salt watch program. So if you're concerned about road salt pollution and you wanna get the word out in your local news sources, we have those templates that you can edit at will and submit uh, to your, your news sources. Um, and then those will be coming soon for our newly launching Nitrate Watch program as well. Nitrate Watch will be launching in early 2023. So stay tuned for that. Awesome. So I'm back from the void. I'm going to be taking this next section where we're talking about social media, which, as we all know, is a really valuable communication tool that should be in everyone's arsenal. And I'm not even sure if this needs mentioned, but it's probably obvious that Sam and I aren't marketing professionals. We don't have advanced degrees in social media communication, um, but we do have lots of experience in using these platforms for a very specific purpose, and that is communicating about water quality and environmental issues. And that's kind of a unique niche that isn't really as well represented if you're going out and looking for social media advice. So hopefully we can impart some tips and advice. So if you're not already aware and on the bandwagon, social media is a really powerful tool that we should all be using when we're trying to spread the word. Um, and one major reason is because there's just so many people using it. Over half of the world's population is represented on social media, which is insane, uh, especially when you consider the fact that these platforms are free to use. You can spend money as much or as little as you'd like to boost posts, but just um, on the basic or the basic level is free for anyone to use. So you have the potential to reach a really wide audience for little or no cost at all. And the reason that social media was originally created was to basically build online communities. And that has a really nice, um, that fits really well in the mission of most environmental and organizing uh, nonprofits because we're trying to build communities in real life. So we can take these communities online and activate them into action in the real world. So on my next slide, I've got a really interesting graph, which was uh, taken from a data portal. They're an organization that compiles a lot of stats around social media, and this was updated in October. So it's pretty fresh. And this represents um, people were asked why they use social media and all of their answers are ranked here. You can see a lot of really familiar and kind of obvious things like people like to uh, kill time and keep in touch with people. I've put a star next to each of the items that people indicated as you know reasons for using social media. They kind of dovetail into the work that we do. 
So for instance, they're looking for content. They're looking for things like articles and videos. Well, we find ourselves sharing our articles or articles of partner organizations or just news stories about uh, the issues that we're trying to address all the time. Seeing what's being talked about kind of goes with the above. Uh, sharing and discussing ideas and opinions, um, finding like-minded communities, like we were talking about with community building. People are looking to uh, find like-minded individuals. And so we want to be there to meet that need and, and uh, harness those uh, passionate individuals. And last but not least, this one ties in really well, supporting or connecting with good causes. So people are looking for ways to make a difference online, and we want to be there to meet that need. So when we're talking about social media, it is a very vast field of possibilities and platforms, and it is honestly kind of daunting, especially if you're not super familiar already. Like I know a lot of us are kind of just getting started according to our poll at the beginning. Um, the take home message is that all of these platforms serve different purposes. They have different characteristics and they have different demographic groups represented in their users, but you do not have to do it all. And in fact, it would be a mistake to try and do it all. So I recommend uh, that you focus on one or two platforms that uh, make sense for you, maybe the ones that you're already familiar with, already using, and really focus your efforts there. Um, we use Instagram and Facebook primarily because those are the ones that make sense for us. They're kind of the big two as far as social media platforms. A lot of people use those. They're easy for us to use simultaneously, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And um, that's where we focus our efforts. So if you're just getting started, I would recommend picking one of these and just going for it. You don't have to do anything that doesn't feel authentic to you. So now I'm going to dive in real quickly, just in case you're less familiar with these two platforms, what makes them kind of unique? And then we'll talk about some tips and advice for your posts. So first, Instagram. Uh, most people probably already know that it's extremely visual. Uh, you need to be posting pictures or graphics if you're posting on Instagram at all. Um, they don't allow just text posts. So this is a picture of our grid, which is like our profile page, and it shows all of our past posts with just the picture as the uh, preview. And so make sure that as you're out in the world doing uh, water quality projects or whatever it is that you're trying to promote, that you're taking some really great pictures and then posting them later. Instagram has uh, reels, which are their short videos, and they, at least right now, are really trying to promote these and get them in front of people's faces. So that means if you are able to take a quick video while you're out and about and share that on Instagram, odds are it's going to be seen by a lot of people because that's just what the algorithm rewards people for doing. So it can be something really simple, like a little crane fly crawling around on your finger, and it has a potential to be seen by lots of people. So those are reels. Um, Brevity is key on all social media, um, but especially on Instagram. Uh, this is a screenshot from just scrolling through the feed, which is like when you see everyone's posts that you're following kind of displayed in front of you. And you can see how we've got the picture nice and big and then the caption is really short and cut off at the bottom. That's normal. And honestly, you're always gonna have your caption cut off because no one's writing like a two word caption and that's fine. Um, but just make sure that you're aware of what's going to be seen and what people will have to click the more to see the rest of. So uh, brief captions. Also, speaking of captions, for whatever reason, and I'm sure there's a great reason and I'm just not aware of what it is, you can't link to things in your Instagram caption. So you can uh, link to other accounts like um, partner organizations, but you can't link to a URL or a website. Instead, uh, you have to use uh, like a third party service. We use Linktree. A lot of other people use Linktree as well to house all of the URLs that you're trying to direct people to. So rather than say visit IWLA.org, you have to say visit the Isaac Walton League website, link in our bio. So in case you're unfamiliar, that's what that refers to. And last but not least, since Instagram and Facebook are both owned by Meta, the parent company. There, It's really easy to post to both organizations, or I'm sorry, both uh, platforms simultaneously. So this is a screenshot from, uh, we're making an Instagram post and it's asking us, do you also want to post this to Facebook? So uh, really easy integration right there. Okay, now Facebook. Uh, also a very highly visual medium, um, but you don't have to use photos. Uh, text posts actually do pretty well on Instagram. Facebook, sorry. But it's a great idea to include uh, pictures or video just to grab people's attention and to convey a little bit more meaning to your post. 
you can include URLs and other links in the body of your text on Facebook. And if you want to link to like an article or a website, it will auto generate a preview, which is really nice to add to that visual layer. Facebook is really centered around community building. And part of that is that you can create events on Facebook. So if you're say hosting a training, like um, this Save Our Streams training, you can create an event on Facebook so that people uh, as they're scrolling for things to do in the area will become aware of that training. And you can actually have folks register on Facebook. Um, if you use something like Eventbrite or like Zoom to collect registrations, you can also input that link for the registration and then people will be able to register through that third party platform on Facebook. So it's actually really simple to use, really user friendly. And then uh, you can share those events far and wide on Facebook. Uh, you can also create groups. So this example I took from the Raccoon River Watershed Association, and they've created this group on Facebook to basically just serve as like a meeting space for folks who live in that watershed or who are interested in the what's happening in that watershed to get together and um, share posts, share photos, share events, um, ask questions. So it's basically just creating a smaller network within the vast uh, area that is Facebook for these people who are interested in this issue. So if that makes sense for you and your organization, it's a great idea just to get everyone together under one big umbrella. And as mentioned before, it's easy to cross post with Instagram. Now, I will say it's not super easy to post from Facebook directly to Instagram. It can be done, uh, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated because Instagram has those photo requirements and they need to be a certain uh, aspect ratio, while Facebook is a little bit more uh, just open range. So you can easily post from Instagram to Facebook, but not as easily vice versa. So now let's talk about what, what is a good post? What do you want to be including when you're posting? Um, first and foremost is visuals. So whether that's a photo, graphics, videos, um, while it might not always be required uh, on Facebook, for instance, it's a great idea just to catch people's attention. Um, attention spans are really short. I know we've all experienced this when you're scrolling on social media. You're not necessarily looking to read a novel <laughs> in the form of a Facebook post, but if you can be drawn in by something like a video or a photo, um, you're probably more likely to remember what you've seen. Um, we want to keep our captions and our content really clear and concise. That not only means clear as in avoiding jargon, like Sam was saying, um, but also really brief. Um, attention spans are short. I, that's going to be a recurring theme. Um, if you have more to say, you can always link to an external source, but try to keep it brief in the caption. Uh, connect with our audience. This is kind of getting to the heart of the mission-based, um, you know, posting. We want to a, know our audience, and B, know what they care about. What is going to make someone care about the issue that you're trying to put in front of them? Um, so in this example, we've got this poor precious dog who's uh, being threatened by road salt pollution. His little feet are drying out and maybe getting into his diet. And so we're, we're tugging on those heartstrings for um, animal welfare, but also uh, environmental pollution and sustainability and all those good things, public health. So we know our audience and we're trying to make the issues relevant to them. This is also true of you know, taking a national issue that is affecting a really broad area and bringing it home for people. So making it relevant to them in their community. And this dog, uh, Sam's dog is okay. Don't worry, he's okay. Uh, last but not least, or maybe this is last. Yes, this is uh, the last uh, item that we've got on this section, but call to action. This is a really important one for us, especially um, with water quality communication or just environmental issues. Um, what are you asking the reader to do? It doesn't need to be groundbreaking every time. You might not always have an action alert where someone can be contacting their uh, policymakers or signing a petition. It can be as simple as just asking them to click on a link or respond to a question. Um, so just be thinking in the back of your mind, can I be asking the viewer to do something every time I'm posting? Um, and know that it doesn't always need to be super impactful and, and like boots on the ground. It can be something light, but you're just trying to convert their eyeballs on your post into some sort of action so that hopefully you can um, continue that process of uh, building a relationship with that viewer. So this one right here is an action alert, and this next slide is just asking folks to 
uh, visit a website and request a link. Both are good examples of trying to take um, a viewer to someone taking action. So now uh, we're going to dive into some social media tips. These are things that we have found that have worked well and just general tips that anyone should be doing on social media. For those beginners, if you're not already aware, we're going to hopefully teach you something new. So first and foremost, be a good partner. Uh, if you are working together with other organizations, say hosting an event together, and you're sharing a post about it on Facebook or Instagram, you better be tagging those organizations so that you can be a good partner to them. Uh, if you're not already tagging folks, it's as simple as just typing the at symbol and then starting to type the name of the organization. If they have a Facebook or Instagram page, it'll pop up. And then when you post, folks who view your post will be able to click on that organization and see what they're up to. So it's just cross pollinating and sharing um, followers so that their followers will see your content and vice versa. Now, the other side of this coin um, on the next slide is reposting. So if you see a post come across your feed that is really great, that you think your followers will connect with, that's the kind of thing that you would post, uh, but someone else has already taken the liber liberty of doing a really great job, then go ahead and repost it. It's totally uh, a, a great thing to do for these uh, other accounts because you're increasing the reach of their post. And it's a win-win because you didn't have to take the time and effort to make that really great post. So in this example, Wisconsin SaltWise, they have a great post about uh, really visually representing how much salt belongs on a sidewalk square. So this uh, is something that we could do, um, but why would we? Because they already did, and it's really great. And we are happy to promote their posts on our page. Encourage interaction. This is uh, the interaction word is like a big buzzword on social media. The algorithms love to reward interaction. And so what that means is people liking, clicking, um, following links, uh, commenting, sharing, all of these things that people can do to like interact with your posts are things that we want to promote. Um, so that's asking a question and encouraging people to leave a comment and answer. People love quizzes. They love, especially uh, our audience with macroinvertebrates loves to be uh, given a question and have to find the answer. It's, I think it's really rewarding too. So, uh, and asking people to, comment. And then when they do comment, make sure that you're responding to those comments, especially if they're asking a question of you. It's a two-way street. And remember, it's all about community building. So we're trying to create those communities online beneath our posts. And like I said, the platforms really love interaction. And so if you have a post that's getting a lot of interaction, odds are they're going to show it to more people. So it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. You'll be getting more interaction because of the interactions that you've got. So definitely encourage uh, asking questions of your viewers. And we've said it before, I'll say it again, photos, especially photos of people. Um, people are more likely to connect with a photo if it's got beautiful smiling faces in it, like this one right here. Um, and I think especially with water quality monitoring, uh, it's really important to show people doing the thing that you're asking them to do. So like, not everyone has gotten out in the stream and picked bugs and sorted them. And to someone who's never done that, that might sound kind of uh, opaque or just not something that they're capable of doing because they've never seen what that looks like. So I think it's important to show uh, people in the field doing the thing, smiles on their faces um, so that other people can see themselves in their shoes. Uh, graphics. We love a graphic because they can convey so much information uh, in fewer words and in a more eye-catching way, and maybe even in a way that someone will want to share on their page because it's so nice looking. Um, we use Canva a lot. Uh, that's actually the platform that we're on right now for this PowerPoint, or I guess it's not a PowerPoint because it's on Canva, for this presentation. Um, Canva does have a free version that you can do a whole lot in without even um, paying anything. Uh, but there is a pro version that has a lot more capabilities. You can also make a lot of really great graphics in like PowerPoint. Um, so consider diving into those. Um, but we love graphics because they make information easier to digest in a lot of situations. And they can also um, convey meaning that would otherwise be making your caption really, really long. Um, keep it simple. So we've talked about this before. We want to use simple language. Uh, avoid fluff and like filler words in your caption, things that are just 
um, making it unnecessarily long. And uh, if you have more to say, which we probably all do, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about, uh, consider linking to a blog or a web page that can uh, expand upon that information. Um, and just know that people can always dive in more if they're interested. But just to make it accessible to everyone, keep it brief, keep it simple, and uh, use graphics and links to expand upon your content. Hashtags. Um, you should be using hashtags if you're not already using them. Uh, they might just look like a weird string of words at the end of a post, and sometimes that's what they are. But what they are meant to be is search terms. So if someone was to search hashtag water quality on Instagram, uh, this post would be one of the many posts that comes up in that search. So we're encouraging folks to include hashtags that are simple uh, phrases or words that people will actually search for. Um, and you can include them in the body of your caption if it makes sense, or just throw them in at the bottom like this one here. Um, but either way, you should be including hashtags so that folks who search for a topic will be uh, shown your post. Heather, someone also said an anonymous attendee said that nonprofits can get the pro version of Canva for free. Um, amazing. That is amazing. Uh, so make sure you're looking out for, for deals like that as well, or if you're working under a nonprofit that you can see if they can get you access to that. We're not sponsored by Canva, but I, I could give a good promo pitch for Canva. They're, they're a great platform. Um, okay, so next is to create shareworthy content. And this is kind of nebulous uh, because what is shareworthy to one person is, you know, maybe not to the next. Um, but to try and grab people's uh, attention, we're talking about like really aesthetically pleasing posts, graphics, um, posts that convey a lot of meaning, uh, talking about like summarizing data or important facts, uh, breaking news. So it's difficult to know exactly what's going to be considered shareable by someone, but trying to make content that you think someone would want to repost. And this is because, like we talked about earlier, uh, as people share your posts, they're going to be seen by exponentially more and more people. And those are people who could become, you know, activists for your cause. So uh, in this example, we posted this on Election Day, which is a day when people are already prone to share uh, just tons of stuff on Instagram, especially. Um, to try and get the word out. It's not really asking people to do anything in particular. We're just uh, joining the conversation, uh, telling people to participate in the democratic process. And we got 50 shares. So that's a lot more people than would normally see our average post. Let's see. Oh, a good reminder that while a lot of people are looking to participate in, uh, you know, complicated discourse or learn how to get involved in an important uh, work. People are also using social media for entertainment value, to kill time, uh, to find things that they think are amusing. So if it makes sense for you and your organization or your brand, um, know that it doesn't always have to be super heavy. Make room for uh, humor, um, nature appreciation. I think the next slide is a video of just some trees moving in the wind. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, groundbreaking news every single post. And uh, this is a good example of a reel that did really well, no pun intended, um, because Instagram just loves to promote these short videos. So over 280 people liked this video. Um, I recommend getting on a schedule with your posts. It doesn't need to be extremely rigid if that doesn't work for you and, you know, how you manage your time, but definitely make it a part of a routine uh, or just, uh, you know, get it on your radar with some consistency. Um, the goal here is to make sure that you're, you have a consistent presence online. If you have a bunch of followers and then you suddenly go silent for a long period of time because it's fallen off your radar, you don't want those people to forget that you exist, right? And I'm sure that you've got stuff going on in the background that could be promoted. So it helps to have that uh, weekly or bi-weekly uh, reminder to post on social media. We have a schedule where basically there's five days of the week, there's five people on the clean water team. So each of us has a day um, and that works for us, but um, hopefully you can find what works for you. Now this next one could be a whole long spiel and it's actually really interesting and I encourage everyone to dive in um, if you're able. 
but uh, exploring analytics. So that's exploring um, how people respond to different posts. And there's many different layers of this. So first of all, I'm talking about if you're managing a, an organization's page, not just an individual. So not my personal Facebook page, but the Save Our Streams Facebook page. Um, you're able to access a whole lot of insights into how your posts are doing, and you can compare those ooh, across different posts, across different platforms, and so on. So this uh, set of screenshots is showing one Facebook post. And so you can see where that little blue arrow is. At the bottom of a Facebook post, it says, see insights and ads. If you click on that link, it'll bring you to this pop-up window that shows you uh, how the post is done and how many people have interacted, how many people have seen it and all this information, you can scroll down, there's even more. The next page uh, shows a pair of screenshots that is for the entire Facebook page. So for the Save Our Streams Facebook page, we can look at the sidebar where the arrow is, click insights, and then it's taking you to an entire page um, of insights for your account. So you can see this page overview is for the last 28 days, but you can set a different time frame if you wanna see the last year, the last six months or all time. Um, see how many people you've reached with your posts, how many people have engaged or liked your page or uh, become followers of your page. What's your top post? Um, that can be really enlightening to see what did people connect with? And maybe you can get to the bottom of why, how can I recreate that? Um, what's your audience uh, demographic makeup? I think is really interesting age, gender, uh, and there's a whole lot more that's not included here because it's just too much information. But I encourage you, if you're able, if you manage a, uh, an organization's Facebook page, to check these out because it's really interesting. And you can hopefully get to the bottom of what people enjoy. And then last but not least is the Meta Business Suite. So remember, Instagram and Facebook are both owned by Meta. And that means that you can use the Meta Business Suite if you, again, if you manage an organization Facebook page to access all kinds of insights for both of those um, platforms. So it's kind of small here because there's just a lot of information, but on the content tab, which is the one that's showing in the screenshot, you can see the uh, Facebook and the Instagram logo next to some of those uh, different little icons. That's showing how well uh, different posted across different platforms. And like I said, you could dive into this and really get lost for a couple hours and just seeing what did well and what did less well and and hopefully discover why. So uh, I definitely encourage you to explore there a little bit more. And of course, this is advice in life as well, uh, but also on social media, just be yourself. Um, just like you don't have to do every platform, you don't have to do every trend, you don't have to do every meme. Um, definitely use memes with caution. Uh, the internet is a kind of a crazy place where things are changing faster than you can even necessarily keep up with. So. Uh, if you see a picture of a guy sprinkling salt and that does not resonate with you, you don't have to repost it. It's okay. There's room for everyone. Uh, but what you don't want to do is try and imitate the trends of a different group or different generation. Um, no one is asking that of you and you don't have to feel pressured to participate in every little thing on the internet. So just be yourself and uh, know your brand and know your audience and try and uh, marry the two together nicely. So with that, I hope you all have been uh, paying attention. I think we're going to dive into a little interactive quiz. We have one question in the chat before we dive into the quiz. Sweet. Um, thoughts on hashtags on Facebook. I've heard varying opinions and curious about yours. I use them. I mean, Sam, you can answer as well, but I, I use them just like I would on Instagram. And part of that is because we're often posting to Facebook from Instagram. Um, and so it's kind of just like a relic of the other platform. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I don't find that hashtags on Facebook negatively affect our reach at all. Mm -hmm. um, I would say people probably access the hashtags less on Facebook than they do on Instagram. Uh, but no matter where I'm posting, I try to keep it to like three to four hashtags just to make sure that they're, you know, heavy hitting and it doesn't look like have you ever scrolled on Instagram where you see like the block of hashtags and then it just looks yeah. like spam. And so we're trying to yeah. avoid that. So we try and do like our, our top three to four hashtags at the end of our posts that will bring like-minded people together uh, without, you know, worrying about having too many or, you know, what's going to, what it's going to reach. So I would say we haven't noticed anything negative happening on our Facebook when we do use hashtags. We just try to keep it limited. Mm -hmm. 
All righty, quiz time. All right, which post do you believe received more likes? And you can see that they're labeled A and B. Um, oh, there's a poll. I'm gonna there watch. is a poll. So I'm launching this poll so we can take a look. Um, so investigate these posts, read the caption, um, and then let us know what you think. And if you have a really compelling reason why you think one post received more likes than the other, go ahead and throw that in the chat as well so we can see what folks are thinking. I think this uh, comparison is actually really interesting because it's too clearly very similar tabling events that we were at. Yeah. Um, With one notable difference. So Zach Moss, hi Zach. Um, B has a human in the picture and a shorter caption. Mark says person B and it's person in B and it's brief, not as long as A. And hashtags. All excellent things to know. Okay, so I'm going to share that Kira is a human. Is that confirmed? Uh, not positive, not clear to me. Um, so we'll end this poll and we'll share the results. So 75% of folks said B, 25% said A. So more folks lean towards B. Um, and I'll stop sharing. We can share our results. You're right. right. B got more likes and a comment. Um, and that is because most likely because of the human that tends to we tend to see that posts where we have humans uh get more likes unless it's a really fun macro invertebrate video with no humans in it and the macros always win so <laughs> all right next one which post had the most interactions um and these are both videos so let's see if they i think they're gonna try and play they're trying to play aren't we all we are asking a lot of this right now, zooming and trying to play multiple videos at once. Either way, picture, pretend these macro invertebrates are, are wiggling about and that'll, that'll help you. So let's see, which had more interactions? And go ahead and type in the chat if you can think of a particular reason why you think one had more interactions. A has a quiz, clarity, because it's close up through our little magiscope. Awesome, we'll give you a few more seconds to get your answer into that poll if you'd like to participate. Use See, of emojis. Interaction right now. <laughs> Use of emojis. That's a good point. Yeah, emojis are actually something we didn't talk about, but people love emojis. Fun fact. All right. Okay. In the poll. Yeah, share the Here's results. This. So 79% said A, 21% said B. Um, sorry, our little videos aren't playing right now. My internet's chugging hard, right? But if you would like to see the videos of these actual posts, you can check it out on our Instagram. Um, and you're right, A did have more interactions. And because it was a pop quiz, that's where we got all of those comments as well, which will help boost those reels up in our feed. All right, did this post reach more users on Instagram or Facebook? So take a look at the post. Um, we'll open up another poll for you all. Okay, should be up. And go ahead and comment again in the in the chat box what you think is the reason for what you answered. Instagram or Facebook.
less busy. Okay. So we're noticing that Instagram is less busy. Instagram is simpler and shorter. So Emily noticed that on Instagram, you can swipe to see all of those pictures. And so you see one at a time and are swiping through it. More engaging because you do have to swipe through those images. Mm -hmm. Mark said link in post. Facebook usually has a broader audience. All right, we'll give you five more seconds to get in your answer to the poll. Okay. okay. So it's a little bit closer on this one, but I think more people were leaning towards Facebook. Should we see it? results? It was Facebook. And this um, is actually kind of surprising for us because our Facebook audience is actually quite a bit smaller than our Instagram audience. Um, so for it to reach more people on Facebook is typically not what happens. Um, I think our thought for this is that you can click the link in the post on Facebook so people didn't have to go all the way to our bio to find the article. So it was easy for people to engage with it there. Um, oh, and, and it was shared also. So mm -hmm. a single share can put it in front of a lot more people. Um, yeah. Yeah, those articles. So that was linked out to an Iowa Public Radio article. And so articles like that tend to do better on Facebook because people see the link, they click on it, they open it up and can read it right there rather than having an extra step in Instagram, which is going to the bio to click on that, that mm -hmm. article. All right. Zach says those Facebook shares really help with reach, not as many reposts and shares on IG. You are correct, Zach. Definitely. All right. So what is working in this post and how could it be improved? So and these are open-ended. So go ahead and just respond in the chat if you have thoughts. Yeah. Please critique away. We will not take offense. Let us know what you think is working and what isn't. And I think this was a video. It was. I think it's just a screenshot, but it mm -hmm. was a video. So imagine these stoneflies wiggling around. Humor. Love it. Heather, was this one of your posts? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Works to ask how many... The riddle made me read it twice, stops the doom scrolling. Ah, yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Asking a question is engaging and gets comments. Short, recognizable quotation, humorous, videos are engaging, interactive. Awesome. Is there anything that folks would improve about this? It's okay if the answer is no. But if you have something you'd like to improve on this post, Now's your chance to type it in. Some sort of call to action. That was what I was also thinking. Mm -hmm. If we could have tied this in with save our streams and water quality monitoring, that would have been a little bit more, I think, impactful. Microscopic images as well, labels for the answer. Yeah, one thing we could have done is uh, put in a story where we like counted out the different stone yeah. forms that we could see. Yeah. Them. Swipe to see them circled, good point. So it's a, how many can you spot and then swipe to see the answer? Awesome point. Make the text bigger. That's hard to do. Can't really make your text that much bigger on Instagram, unfortunately. Um, but if we were to, to type on the actual, like make a graphic where it's on the actual picture, that's your opportunity to put larger text on your Instagram posts. All right, so we can go ahead to the next one. What is working in this post and how could it be improved? So this was an Instagram post where you swipe to see all of these different graphics in there. So it doesn't look like this all together. You see that season five wrap up one, then you swipe to see the data and then you swipe to see the results. And here's the caption here as well. So what's working and how could it be improved? Go ahead and type that out. Pie chart in the middle. So another communications tactic is use a different chart. Mm -hmm. I would never read all that text. So maybe 
shorten up the caption and link to another place where you can expand upon that. The colors are great. The color coding makes it immediately understandable what is trying to be communicated here. One of the things that we tend to do is if we have a longer chunk of information that we want to portray, we'll either link to an article that was like in our magazine, or we will link to a blog post. Um, and we have a little bit more control over when the blog posts come out. So we can type up all of our results into one spot um, and link out. Also, the season five results are on our website too. So we could we could have linked to the website as well. Uh, this I think would be a good example of quote unquote share worthy content. If you participated in SaltWatch and you were, or maybe even a partner organization, you might be compelled to share this on your page to say, this is what I was a part of, or this is what our organization supports. And it could go in a story, it could go on your feed. Um, but because it's summarizing so much in a graphic format, I think it would be uh, something people would like to share. Yeah, Drew says um, we could have number, you know, talked about the number of volunteers in proportion or number of volunteers per state. So it seems like we could have broken this. This was a national breakdown of our SaltWatch program. And it seems like there's an opportunity to also call out specific regions or states for some more information. And then um, a lot to take in, maybe say less to convey more. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of links, we're talking about linking to external places. That was one thing that I noticed when I looked at this is that the link is not clickable. So this was posted on Instagram and it says saltwatch.org. You couldn't click on that if you wanted to, but you could find it in our bio. So that's one maybe room for improvement. Yeah, so when we do put links in our Instagram caption, like they're here, we make sure they're our shortest links possible. So mm -hmm. IWLA.org, saltwatch.org. If once you start putting a slash in there and adding a bunch of extra to get somebody to a very specific spot, they're never going to be able to copy. That's the other thing is you can't copy it out of that caption either. Yeah. So you want to make sure that if you are putting links in there, try and keep them in your bio. But if they do end up in the caption, make sure they're just, you know, two words dot org or whatever it may be. Yeah. Maybe spread the stats out between more than three slides to make them easier to digest at a glance. I love that. So I think it, it sounds like we just did too much with this post and we should have broken it down, maybe done a week long highlight of season five salt watch results where we did a different uh, piece of it per day. Awesome. So that was the end of our quizzes and questions. And so thank you all for your feedback. It seems like um, there's a lot of folks on here that are pretty skilled with their social media. So now here's the opportunity to ask us questions. Um, and if you're interested in, in checking out our Instagram or Facebook, the, uh, the names of those are down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we encourage you also, if you're getting out there and monitoring or sharing results, go ahead and tag us in your post. Um, we'd love to see what you all are doing, repost those, share them in our stories and the like. Um, but I will open it up to see if anybody has any questions. Let's see. Deborah wants to know what doom scrolling is. Heather, what's doom scrolling? Well, it's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, scrolling and scrolling and getting into the spiral of <laughs> negative uh, news cycle. Basically, there's a lot to be unhappy about on social media, but you just can't tear yourself away. It's like watching a car wreck. So that's doom scrolling. So we're happy to break that up for someone. Yeah, unfortunately with water quality, we do our fair share of adding to the doom scrolling. Um, but we also try to break it up with fun volunteer pictures, volunteer highlights, success stories, macroinvertebrate pictures, humor, puns. And we're giving people something to do, uh, not just simmer in the, you know, bad place, <laughs> but to actually take part in something that's uh, a force for positive change. So less doom. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I'll give folks another like 20 seconds, type it in. Um, 
So we encourage you all to just go out and start testing out some posts on social media. What are your thoughts on how to measure behavioral changes with your social media audiences? This is an excellent question. And like one of the toughest things to track is what people are actually taking action. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few ways that we try and do it. Um, one of them is by uh, a lot of our call to action for folks is to sign up for a program that involves taking a pledge. Um, so for Salt Watch and what we'll do for Nitrate Watch is uh, they sign up to get a test kit, but then they also have to take a pledge and give us their contact info. And we can then follow up to see if they've made any behavioral changes. Um, one of our calls to action is also to just have folks share what they're doing to make a difference. And that's one way to kind of grab some of that narrative information that isn't necessarily just like a stat on a post, like what we saw on the last slide. Um, so those are a couple different ways to do it, encouraging folks to share. Um, we've also given prizes for folks to share when they share. So like share your success stories with us and be entered into a prize. And that helps encourage folks to actually take the time to, you know, type out their success story rather than just, you know, scrolling past our posts. Um, so those are all different things that we do. It's definitely the most difficult um, and it involves the most time intensive as far as following up with those individual folks to see what they're up to. Um, if you can highlight successes caused by volunteers, more might volunteer. That's true. Um, so we do try and, and highlight those success stories from volunteers. In some of our programs, we have we call out our trainers. Um, we have salt watchers of the month for those folks going above and beyond. Um, and then we also try and break the down what they do into really, you know, kind of tangible things that are easy for other folks to do. So we're not trying to put our superstars up on a pedestal so that other folks think that they couldn't achieve what they achieved. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, a copy of this presentation will be available. Um, give us uh, probably 36 to 48 hours to get it up on our YouTube. And then it's on our webinars from the experts page on our website. And if you, for some reason, can't find that, just shoot us a note and we can send it your way once it's up. Um, and with that, I think that's all of the questions that we have. So thank you all so much for attending this webinar on sharing our strategies for social media successes. Um, if you all have any questions, our contact info is on this last slide here. Um, and you know, our contact info is also all over the Isaac Walton League website. So, so should you misplace that, you can find us fairly easily. Um, but let us know if you have any lingering questions, share your results on social media and make sure to tag us so we can see it because we love highlighting our volunteers and what they're up to. So thank you everyone. Have a good day. Have a great rest of your week.